Welcome to episode 61 of Character Unlock. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to start this. How do we normally start them? I don't know. Just by talking and it happens. Okay. Welcome to episode 61 of Character Unlock. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, it's, it's just a, 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 another week. Thank you for joining us, I suppose. Yeah, uh, I'm hosting this week, as you can plainly hear. Plainly, probably not. I don't know what I'm talking about today. Uh, joining me, as always, is my good buddy John. Hi. Hello, mate. And for the first time in about two years, we figured out just before we started recording, is returning to talk Resident Evil yet again is our good mate, Matt Lamborn. How are you, mate? Good evening, fellas. Yeah, I'm doing good. And when a new zombie game comes to town, you get me out of my coffin and dust me off, and here I am. Didn't okay. want to let you down. Hey, dude, it's so good having you on. I love having... You're such a cool dude to talk to on the podcast. Everybody loves listening to you, as do I. I get to shut up for a bit and listen to you talk, which is amazing, because no one wants to listen to me chatting bollocks. You know, yeah, wrong. but your audience doesn't know who I am. They don't care. Of course they do. You have to throw some interesting questions at me. Well, this is the thing, you see. So it has been a while since you've been on, and since the last time you were on, we've kind of introduced this thing where we're asking guests questions the first time they come on. Uh, so, are you ready for a few questions? Go for it, mate. We'll jump straight into this. So, uh, I don't care if it's new, old, or even a board game. I want to know what your favourite gaming platform is. Ugh, okay. I will say, um... I've been really looking forward to you coming on to this since we introduced <laughs> these questions. Because you are the only person I know that still regularly plays 30-year-old console games. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that they're the best. No, uh, but... there's, a, there's a lot of nostalgia yeah. that makes up the retro gaming experience. I mean, there are some games that are legit as good today as they were back then, but they are few and far between if we're really honest with each other. So it would be um, unfair of me to go and say, well, the Super Nintendo or the Mega Drive is the best, because they're not. They're not. <laughs> they're, they're, they, they were in their day, and they're very special to us all who had them when we were younger. But yeah. I mean, if if we're brutally honest, PC gaming is where it's at, and I say that as I'm not a PC gamer these days. It's just too much hassle and expense for me. I, I hear that. <laughs> over the, the the course of time, PC gaming has always been where the big boys play. It's the best gaming experience if, if you're good at gaming with a mouse and keyboard and you can afford the expense of having a top gaming rig. That's where you're going to get the best gaming experiences, and that goes for today, goes for 10, 20 years ago. I mean, there was a time when I really first got into gaming, uh, 30 odd years ago, where PC gaming was very distinctly different from console gaming. You wouldn't get on a PC good sports games or good platformers, and PC was good for strategy games and adventures and, and text based RPGs and stuff. But now they're, they're so alike that they would difference is the hardware that's pushing them, the quality of the hardware and if you're a gamer today and you want the best you have to you have to have a pc and so i would say that over the course of 30 years the pc's consistently delivered the best gaming experience but if you want me to sort of pin my hopes on a single console then it's pr- it's probably the original playstation it changed nice. everything uh, had had the the widest library of games. You know, it had decent two D games. You know, it was definitely second in terms of two D performance to the Sega Saturn, but it had enough to to hold its own, and the three D experience was unparalleled at the time. And it was such a a great period of gaming creativity. Uh, you know, it did sort of usher in a, the shovelware crazes we saw over many console yeah. seats. Yeah, and a lot of it's bullshit. The for out and out quality and quantity, uh, PlayStation I think reigns supreme in, in in the console spectrum. That is a that is a damn good answer. I, d- I do agree with you about PC gaming uh, as well. I wish I had the time and money and energy and inclination to be a PC gamer. I was talking to a mate of mine the other day. Uh, we I can't remember what we were talking about. I oh, will talk. He asked if I'd played Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And I was like, "What? Well, yeah, but I, yeah." I can't stop playing fucking Hitman 2. I, I go to put on a quick game and 
a Switch on Hitman 2. I don't want to play Assassin's Creed. And he was like, I was afraid you were going to say that because I need to buy it. I ain't got any money. He was like, well, okay. He's a uni student. I don't expect you to have any money. He went, yeah, I just, I just, uh, I just upgraded my, my PC with new graphics card. I was like, so what's that? Like two, three hundred quid? He went, four hundred and sixty pound. Mm-hmm. Four hundred and sixty pound for a graphics card. Four hundred and sixty pound. I could buy a console and some games and still have money for pizza that night. What the fuck? Absolutely not. <laughs> I yeah, but, it's, but it, you're getting those those buttery smooth frame rates and competitive edge. There, there is that. There, there is absolutely that. And he said the exact same thing. He was like, but you're, he, he literally went, you're never going to play Battlefield 1 the way I am. I went, and I, I'm sad about that. Because the days I used to play PC gaming, Battlefield was where it was at. <laughs> but, uh, Interesting what happens in the next console generation, PS5, Xbox 2, whatever they're going to call them. Because if they're going to be relevant in the next generation against PC gaming, then you can get a competitive PC rig for the price of a brand new console. And it's, oh, of you know, course you can. He, he, his, his example is an extreme one, and he does spend on his PC. And he does spend a lot. But he's also a PC gamer, a cyber security student. Uh, you know, he's a programmer, a hacker. Uh, he he okay, spends so money on he, his He's computer. one of those folks. So yes, he is. He, he doesn't see daylight right? very often. Bless but him. then if I consider that, you know, on this generation, I firmly backed Xbox, and I was definitely incorrect to do so in the beginning. I would say they've more than made up for it since. Yeah. But I've, I've owned four or five Xbox Ones, that would have made a perfectly good gaming PC that would have lasted all of that time and, and still be relevant today. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I, I have got, I've gotten out of, I say I've gotten out of, I was talking to uh, our, our mate, well, from last I've loaded column from last I've I was talking to him this morning saying I, I regret getting rid of my Vita and my uh, PSVR and I'm going to buy them again because I want them again. But, I'd, but apart from that, I've kind of, I've tried very hard to get out of the habit of getting rid of machines and buying new machines just because I want the newer machine. I I wait till these machines die now or, or until they upgrade before I spend on them again because I just yeah. I, can't, I can't justify keep buying three four hundred pound consoles. Anyway, <laughs> uh, question two. This is where I think this gets interesting. What are your three desert island video games? So if okay. you had to play three games forever, you were stuck with just those games, what are you playing? Okay, so I've been quite fixed on my top three games of all time for as long as I can remember, so I guess I'll just choose those. Okay. Um, so in no particular order, Mario 64. I say in no particular order, I think that is my favourite <laughs> video game of all time. Good um, choice. Absolute magic. Um, never been so wowed by a game. I saw for the first time and back then, particularly when you combine it with how freaky the analog control was at first hand when yeah. you first got your hands on an N64. That was a, a far out experience. So Mario 64. Um and then a couple of PC games. Um so that ties in nice with my first answer. So um next one would be Half Life. Okay. Uh, in terms of one, the, the single player campaign on that was outstanding and to a, a quality that we hadn't seen ever prior to, to its release. And it's certainly been the benchmark for you know, intelligent first-person shooters since then. And, of course, you also factor in the, the multiplayer expansion of that with stuff like Team Fortress Classic, Counter-Strike, when it was you know firmly attached to Half-Life in its first iteration rather than a standalone game. Yeah. I lost a lot of hours playing those games and <laughs> ran up a huge dial-up internet phone bill. <laughs> I feel, um, did you and me live in the same house? Because this, this sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah, we probably did. <laughs> or maybe we were just uh, like dialing each other up over yeah. one side of the country to the other, as I regularly was doing via modem. Oof, those were the days. And then I would say my last one is it's probably the game I've sunk the most hours into if I excluded championship manager games. And that would be Civilization 2. Wow, okay. Yeah, that's... Classic. That is a serious hour eater. Yes. You know, it, it's very much... 
the poster child for the one more go category of game <laughs> that ends up keeping you up all night and you're going into work in absolute state the next day. Yes. Um, but that's one of the first games I've owned on PC. It's one of the, the games that made me get my first game on PC. And uh, infinite replayability. And if you're a bit of a history geek, which I can be from time to time, it's just extremely interesting to play. And uh, it's quite handy because it, it runs quite nicely on my Mac. I can play it via virtualization. Nice. On a, like a Windows XP installation, just runs very low resource in the background on a more than modest MacBook. Yeah. It's just perfect. So I can carry on playing it without specialized retro hardware. And it's, it's just fantastic. So those would be my, my free Desert Island games. Nice. There's some good answers there, man. Some very good answers. Uh, so then who is your favorite game character? <laughs> I struggled with this one when you, when you told me you were going to be asking me this. And, uh, hmm. In reality, I should write all these answers down so I can go back to them the next time you come on and go, so have any of these changed? Yeah, because I'm pretty sure every week my answers would change. Well, most well, I don't of my play. Answers anyway. I don't play as many new games as you guys do, so it shouldn't be subject to change as much as you and John. If you if you're playing a lot of new stuff, um, probably Big Boss from from Metal Gear. Okay, I yeah. didn't see that coming. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a character of a certain uh, morality that I quite like. Fair enough. <laughs> It'd be very easy for me to pick someone from Castlevania because that's that's my jam. But genuinely, yeah. I thought that's what you were going to do. Yeah, but we don't we don't go into a lot of like char- character expansion. It's more visual coolness yeah. than uh, getting deeper into someone's mindset, and particularly in the more recent Metal Gear Solid games. You learn a lot about these characters and their motivations because Hideo Kojima is such a talented yeah. writer and developer of characters. So, yeah, I would particularly after Metal Gear Solid Five, I, I would say that that Big Boss is a uh, is my guy. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so the fourth question is: What is your favorite game soundtrack? I could choose some lows because you know I, I collect video game vinyl. I know this is why this is why I've been looking forward to asking you these questions. Right, I'll give you a little bit of, 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 of <laughs> <laughs> a roundabout answer to this, if I may, purely because I, things that I until recently wouldn't have considered to be that good have really gotten into to my head as a, a real earworm uh, through video game vinyl collecting. And the one that, that sticks with me that I doubt anyone would anticipate, I would say, particularly if they saw which ones I actually had in my collection, is is Afterburner 2. Okay. It's just it's just so good. It is I a mean, good it, soundtrack. It, if you like your Top Gun type stuff, you know, that, that cheesy sort of 80s metal. Yeah. It's just absolutely fantastic. I can't say it's the best ever, because it's not, but it, it's very much flavour of the moment for me, but... But it's, it, was it's say, a perfect um, soundtrack. To, it, it's a, it, it brings back memories as well. That's the thing about a soundtrack like that. And it's not just necessarily about playing the game. But like you say, it, it, it brings back all those memories around things like, like Top Gun and being a kid. And yeah, I, I'm all right with that, mate. It's a good answer. Well, that's, that's the thing. I don't have a lot of nostalgic attachment to After Do you not? I think, it, I think it's an okay game. I mean, okay. it's a very good arcade game if you're sit, sitting in the proper cab. That was it. I, 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 throwing I, all over the place. I didn't play it at home. I played in the cab a lot. Yeah, but if you play it at home, it's distinctly average on yeah. just that <laughs> format because you lose so much of the experience. Yeah. But listening to it with almost fresh ears now, it's, it's absolutely amazing. But if I was to go for a bonafide, this is my absolute definitive answer. It's uh, Super Castlevania 4 no, on that, Super Nintendo. That is a soundtrack. That is a soundtrack. I may. Certainly not for everyone. No, maybe not.
finally then, mate, what is your, your favourite gaming memory? Now, I I don't know if I, I... I've tried to word this as as good as I can, but it's any any memory that comes... To, anything that comes to mind when you think about gaming, what's your favourite, like, straight go-to memory when it comes to... Might be playing games, might be... I don't know, standing in line for your, your new Xbox on a midnight release, if that's your... Hmm. If that's, that, your... Uh, that's a good memory, actually. Uh, I could go for something more old school and, and less relevant to the people who perhaps listen to this podcast, but um, on a more recent thing, I remember you know, talking about 10 years ago, I first moved over to the Isle of Man, and gaming was... Um, a bit of a savior for me because I didn't know many people here when I first moved over. So didn't have a very active social life. So needed something to get lost in when I'd finished work. And not long after I moved over here, Modern Warfare 2 came out. I just moved over from full-time hardcore PC gaming to, to get in my Xbox 360, you know, a year or so before Modern Warfare 2 came out. Uh, and I played Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare on PC relentlessly. <laughs> Uh, so this was the first multiplayer Call of Duty experience I'd had on console, so I was quite excited about it. And I went down to game at midnight, first time I'd gone to a midnight launch. And I was I already had a, a 360, but I was so excited I wanted to get the Modern Warfare 2 Elite console and the game nice. in, and spoil myself. So I did. And, yeah, um, by far the biggest midnight release I've ever seen. It's not even come close since. Bearing in mind, I've only been to midnight launches over here. I've not been to one in the UK, but they were queuing around two blocks in the rain yeah. to get this game. I, um, I don't think... Uh, I've only been to a couple. I don't think midnight releases have hit that, so that kind of size since. Not for anything. I don't, I don't care... If, if we're talking, you know, Red Dead or Far Cry's or anything, nothing has hit the just the insane amount of people chasing to get Modern Warfare Two the day it came out. Yeah, that that was a million miles ahead of everything else. I've been to a couple of decent sized FIFA launches, but that's just you know, Red Bull munching tracksuit clad and kids who <laughs> didn't want to go to bed yet. Uh, it's a very distinct crowd that go to those. Yes. This, Modern Warfare 2 had everybody. And, yeah, the fact that people were just happily standing out in the rain on a cold November evening around two blocks. And this is when Game in the Isle of Man used to be two doors down from quite a rough pub. So yeah. I bet they, people were getting some shit yeah. off, <laughs> off some of the drinkers that night. Like, what are you want to send out here for at midnight in the game, you sad bastards? Do you still have but, a game uh, on the Isle of Man? Yes, yes, we do. Yeah, I've got a, a decent relationship with with Al, who runs Game Over Here, and he's he's hooked me up with a few nice things before. Um, they get like promotional items into the shop. You see those big cardboard cutouts and stuff that they have, and he passes a few of those on to me if it's something he thinks is relevant. He got me this really big um, wall flag for Doom because I uh, ordered the. Um, whatever the super special edition was that came with the Revenant statue. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember. Of that back then. So he takes care of me, yeah. So, nice. Uh, yeah, Game Over are pretty cool. And it's, it's the only place over here you can buy games now because we don't have an HMV. Well, Tesco do, but it's a small range. Well, yeah, Tesco's, if you want to buy FIFA at five quid over the asking price, Tesco's is the mm-hmm. place to go. Yeah, exactly. So I'd say... In terms of more recent experience, that was as, as exciting as, as it's gotten. That's uh-huh. good. I I remember the the day Modern Warfare Two came out. I was at work, and I was watching stuff on the news at work. And I remember like Sainsbury's were doing insane deal. Every supermarket was doing an insane deal to get you into the shop to buy this game. Yes. Uh, I nipped out of work in my lunch break to go into game to buy it, and they'd sold out. At this point, we had two games and a game station in a very small. Uh, area of Milton Keynes shopping centre uh, and all of them yeah. had sold out I ended up no shit driving round to Sainsbury's to get this game where there was a queue going out the door at 11 o'clock in the morning for people who were still trying to get hold of a copy of Modern Warfare 2 it was insanity I've yeah, never and this seen the thing, anything they, like it they, they say that subsequent Call of Duties like 
MW3 or, or Black Ops were bigger selling, but I, I didn't personally witness the furore over it that I did. They, uh, I think they Modern might have been Warfare bigger 2. selling, but they weren't as big a deal. Yeah, I think that's that's accurate. Yeah. You know, it, it, Call of Duty got to a point, I, I think it's probably tapered off a bit now, but Call of Duty got to a point where everybody was buying it because Call of Duty coming out every year was an event. But the thing with Call, with Modern Warfare 2 was not only was it an event, every everybody was really excited for it. Not just new Call mm. of Duty coming out. Everyone was Yeah, and, and this was me, prior this new... to, to the the yearly cycle and now we had Modern yeah. Warfare and it was probably about eighteen months and then you got World of War and then another eighteen months and you got Modern Warfare two. So it wasn't It wasn't it wasn't the first Thursday the or the first Tuesday of November every yeah, year. Yeah, there there was a there was a wait. Modern Warfare like changed the standard of, of online multiplayer gaming forever. And it was particularly great on consoles. You know, they programmed it really well, 60 frames per second on, on Xbox 360 in particular, so it was buttery smooth. Yeah. Equal to the PC experience. No problems. Everyone loved it. And then um, I think it's Treyarch who did uh, World of War, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, it was, yeah. And that was, you know, I would say almost as good. Some people would say it was even better, which is fine. So people were absolutely rabbit to get their hands on Modern Warfare 2 by the time that had come out because there'd been a sufficient gap in between. And I do wonder if Activision want to keep this gravy train running that they they do need to stagger the releases a bit more to build up more hype because no one gets excited every November now because they know what's coming. I, it's FIFA in September, Call of Duty in November, every yeah. year a fail. And it's hard to get excited about that when you know it's coming. And we tend to know a couple of years ahead of time precisely which of the Call of Duty various franchises are coming. Yeah, I, I think the... I, I'm curious to see what they do next year because this year was the first year, I think, or last year, I suppose, we're, we're talking. So 2018 was the first year I think I've seen or I remember seeing Activision running from another game. So they shifted their release to get away from Red Dead Redemption. Now... Yeah, which which is interesting. Which five years you, ago they wouldn't have done that, not in a million years. No, five years but, ago, Call of Duty would have outsold anything it went up against. I don't care what it was because it's yeah, Call of Duty. This is more of the point that Rockstar take their time to make these. Oh big yeah, games. yeah, absolutely. But they're quite happy to take three or four years to make a game and not put anything out in between. Whereas you know, the shareholders at Activision they need a yearly instalment and you know, well, that, that's, that's the thing, isn't it? That's that's the. Uh, Everybody, you got to do better than last year. You have massive profit this year. Next year needs to be better because if next year ain't better, there's going to be some fucking job losses. And, yeah. it, you know, and we're, we're living in a fortnight world now where that old business model can't be sustained. No. So uh, they really need to think long and hard about how they do Call of Duty for the long term now. It probably needs to be free and it needs to be less often. Like yeah. four- if it's going to go multiplayer only, I think you're right. Fortnite will last for years as it is just with constant content updates in the existing framework. So you might just have a bog standard Call of Duty universe that gets regular content updates, whether it's paid for or, or free, but you're not buying a 50 quid annual release anymore. That's that's gone now. Fortnite's changed the game. Yeah. And if Activision and, and EA want to compete, they have to follow suit. And I think Activision are a better place to do that in EA quite frankly because Blackout on Call of Duty 4 is is fantastic yeah I, everybody I know that, that's played it that isn't me uh, has <laughs> what that, in reality and I, I say this not I don't I'm not bashing on people that play Blackout it's not my you game better not be no I'm not it's not my game I tried it I didn't hate the game I just don't like the game style you know I had the exact same reaction to PUBG and Fortnite I'm not bashing on Call of Duty in the slightest you know, I I wanted Blackout to do well. I said quite a lot last year that I really want Blackout to do well. I really well before when it was just Call of Duty Battle Royale. I want it to do well. A AAA developer or a AAA publisher doing that mode well is going to change the game, and I can't wait to see what happens in the next year. Uh, but Battle Royale mode just isn't my game. <laughs> it's, I I find it frustrating. I'm relatively shite at multiplayer gaming i need a couple of hours to get warmed up and that can't happen in a game in a mode in a mode like battle royale 
So it's just it's not for me. Yeah, I think that's the the challenge the industry has now is battle royale is such a competitive game mode. Yeah, that people who who are admittedly not at the the upper echelons of of competitive gameplay will struggle to find enjoyment in that game long term unless there's something else to do. And that's where Fortnite is so clever because it basically allows you to buy a bunch of toys yep. on the cheap. Yep. Dick around with. Dick, dick around with, have fun with your mates. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you win always because you're just enjoying playing with your content that you've bought. Yeah. And Blackout doesn't have that yet. It's still a very competitive facing game. So eventually it will drive away some of the the more casual players that it needs to sustain itself because that's what happens to Call of Duty every year. Yeah. Millions uh, of people buy it, they're in for the first few months and then by the end of the year it's just a hard the try hard to left yeah. and it's but that's nowhere the thing, near though, as isn't much it? fun. It's, it's not that's not exclusive to a battle realm mode. That's that's just like you say, Call of Duty yeah. every year. In, in, in blackout because it, it it's really competitive and the um the skill gap is massive. Yeah. There's so much more you can do to achieve victory or to basically fuck up yeah. in Blackout compared to multiplayer. And you know every death is more costly because it's going to be a couple of minutes before you're back into your next game. You're not going to immediately respawn if you die. Yeah. So the, the consequences of failure are much higher and that will piss people off. Well, yeah, the, co- the, the consequences game. of failure are really fucking frustrating and that's why I don't play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but the... The thrill of victory is so much sweeter. Yeah. And that that's the trade off. I, I wouldn't know, I've never got there. Victory is very hard to attain. I mean, yeah. I, I would consider myself a pretty good Call of Duty multiplayer gamer over the course of the last 10 years. Yeah. So I thought Blackout would be a piece of piss for me. And it always oh, not. Oh, it's <laughs> really fucking hard. I've played, and I, I, I counted my stats on this before I came onto this podcast, and just in case this conversation came up. And I played two thousand matches of Blackout. Fucking hell! And we won twenty. It's still better odds than I'd ever have. Yeah. <laughs> For someone who thinks they're, they're okay, pretty piss poor amount of victories. It's just so difficult. Yeah. Uh, but, but that's good. That it, you know, sticking that challenge in there because I do know an awful lot of people that play Call of Duty and just go, "It's just too easy for me now." So, yeah, it, it can get like that, but it's, it's always going to be difficult, no matter how good you are, to consistently win at Blackout. Yeah, that's good. I, I am very aware that I'm not the target audience for most video games now. I like a nice, crisp, 8 to 10 hours single player experience, and then I can be done with it and move on to the next thing, because that's basically a month's worth of gaming for me. You know, uh so I don't sit there and hope that I'm going to get good at Blackout or hope that they make something for me. I don't need it. I don't want it. Hopefully, at some point, one of the big franchises, and I'm kind of hoping it's Battlefield, makes a nice new modern shooter because I'm sick to the back teeth of World War One and Two. Yeah, I, me too. And I would really like, you know, I know everybody screams for it in the Battlefield community. I'd really like Bad Company 3. Uh Something like I've that. always uh, liked Battlefield Vietnam, and I'm not referring to the new one that sort of came out on the Xbox 360, and that I never played that, so it could be really good for all I know. But um, Battlefield Vietnam was the sequel to the original Battlefield, yeah. which was 1942 on the PC yeah. many, many years oh, ago, and that was a days. great game. Yeah, well, Battlefield 1942 was where I, I well, that I, Battlefield 1942 was where I really started getting into online multiplayer. Uh, before that, it was RTS games and Unreal. So, well, Quake. But, yeah, Battlefield 1942 and onwards, that was where I really got into got into multiplayer. See, I'm one of the few people in this world that still scream for more. I loved 2142. I thought no, I never played that. that. I thought it was um, amazing. I loved Titan Mode, and it was great fun. Uh, but, like, Battlefield, like Bad Company multiplayer was a bit shit, uh, but it was the first time they'd ever had rush mode. But by the time we got to Bad, uh, Bad Company 2, it was crisp, it was beautiful, it was an amazing experience, and I want more of that. I love Battlefield 3 and 4, don't get me wrong, I'd play more of those as well. The shift back isn't my jam anymore. I don't, I don't play, I, don't, I can't be dealing with 
you know, single shot rifles across massive battlefields is just not my thing. Yeah, that's always been the thing about World War Two themed games for me are quite dull because the weapon set is quite limited. Yeah. Um, yeah. I find the weapons of that era very, very uninteresting. Yeah. I, I so understand. it's hard to, to get into them, to be honest. I mean, back in the old days, you play something like Medal of Honor, you're running around with them one Garand, and that's cool when you pop off five bullets in the clip, bang, ding! Yep. But everything else is really, <laughs> really, really boring. Yeah. Yeah, so, this um, is... It, it's not... It's. I don't really... I don't like playing those games. I'm pretty sure, I, you know, if they'd done a modern shoot, if they'd done... This, I don't know, Battlefield 4-2 or whatever they want to call it I'd buy it and I'd spend 30-40 hours playing multiplayer and then move on to something else just because my game time is so limited but I would like to at least try I miss having a multiplayer game to jump into <laughs> yeah it'd be interesting if, if more people explored the sort of Cold War era like Call of Duty did with the original Black Ops I think that had a really balanced weapon set between you know, sort of older, more quirky weapons, and it was just sort of version on modern stuff. Yeah, yeah, so that was really cool. Uh, uh, I'd like to see more of that. Whereas it's become more progressively futuristic, and I like the Black Ops games, all of them, but I would like it to go a little bit further back, but certainly not Second World War stuff. Yeah, see, the thing with Black Ops for me was, I'm still a campaign player, and I loved the campaign for Black Ops. Mm. Well, I played that recently for the first time off the back of. Your recommendation, and I did really enjoy it. It is a great um, story. Two and three, not so much. But Black Ops One, actually, I really like. Like it's a, it's a really well put. It's basically the Manchurian Candidate in first-person shooter form. I'm, yeah, and I was okay with that. Yeah, and I it explored the alternative universes of uh, the Kennedy assassination and whatever. It was very yeah. clever. A little bit of artistic license never went to miss. And Treyarch have always been a bit braver than. The other developers of Call of Duty and, and, and going down those routes, but yeah. Uh, yeah, a bit more old school or modern warfare type stuff would be appreciated. But uh, God knows where where they're going next. But I would imagine the next Call of Duty is going to be even more battle royale focused. So, oh, absolutely! But Blackout's been a massive success. So they they I would be surprised if <laughs> if Activision went, yeah, we don't need that anymore. Let's do something else. That won't happen. Not yet. Yeah. We shall see. Yeah. Are you still there, John? Have we bored you to death? Uh, bit of both. Bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, John. Uh, I tell you what, then, because we've we've kind of we just chatted on, and most of the new stuff that I've got listed down, I think I, we can tie into what we've been playing as well. So, do we just want to jump in and start talking about what we've been playing this week? Yep. Let's might as well. Yeah? Uh, Matt, what have you been playing, mate? <laughs> well, the only thing I've played this week, and I've played a lot of it, is Resident Evil 2 Remake. Um, I don't, are we going to go into this in more detail in another segment, or are we just going to go through it right just, we'll, we'll just go, we'll go straight in. Uh, obviously, don't go too mad with spoilers, but no, you can't really spoil much of Resident Evil 2. It's a twenty-year-old like game. Played, yeah, twenty-year-old game. It, it doesn't offer a lot of uh, new no. revelations. No, it doesn't. Uh, but yeah, let's just we'll just crack on. I did. It, it, did you see the the sales numbers for it, or the ship yeah. numbers for it? Sorry, not so. It seems to have done incredibly in the West. Um, surprisingly, it's been outsold by. Uh, Kingdom Hearts 3 in Japan. That doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Well, it's uh, quite significantly. So it's, um, yeah, that is a surprise because I, I would have thought that you know, Biohazard, as they call it over there, would be extremely popular. But uh, it's you know, not the Japanese it's not, delight for their RPGs. It's not marketed for the Eastern uh, territories anymore, though, is it, Resi? It, like, that Seven is not a Japanese game. Not even no, remotely. I, I, that's a, a fair observation. And the fact that they, they made an effort in the naming of the Resident Evil 7 and, and called it Biohazard and, and yeah. flipped it in Japan, it was Biohazard Resident Evil. They're really trying to realign where the primary focus is of that franchise, as you say. And I would say it certainly started off as a very Japanese-friendly game. Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, 23? 23 years ago? 
Yeah, something yeah. like that. And uh, it, it absolutely one hundred percent Japanese focus game. Yeah, as much as it was. Design, over here. If you were a Japanese gamer, it was probably quite easy to forget that you were essentially looking at American characters because yeah. of how primitive the graphical hardware was back then. Yeah, and then uh, when you got to the occasional cutscene, but and it, now when you ended up in other countries, it then it didn't matter whether it was for you know Western audiences or not. It, you, it, you were playing Resident Evil in other countries, and I think it was still marketed not as a Japanese game. But Japanese gamers, it was marketed towards Japanese gamers as well. Whereas these, like Resident Evil Seven, didn't feel like it would have been mar- It didn't feel like it would have been able, been able to sell in Japan very well. I know it did, but not as well as other Resident Evil games. And this one, again, because it looks like Resident Evil Seven, <laughs> you know, as great as it is, it looks like Resident Evil Seven. Yeah, uh, I mean. If I was to to sum up, because people have been asking me since I I picked it up last Friday, and what's it like? Is it any good? And it's like it's literally they take old Resident Evil two, and took the peeled the skin off Resident Evil seven and just stitched that bad boy on top of it, and that's yep. what you've got. It is Resident Evil two, wearing Resident Evil 7's clothes, and that's no bad thing. It's not. It really isn't. Uh, I said this to a guy at work. He said, "How is?" I went, "Well, it's it's a." Uh... If you if Capcom allowed people access to their engine, it is the mod we would have been playing a year ago. Yeah, <laughs> it's, very true. <laughs> I mean, they they shut down that that independent mod that was going around they whenever did. it was. They did, and for for good cause because it would have absolutely stole the thunder off off of this one. Yeah, but um, it, it goes about saying that I'm really enjoying uh, Resident Evil Two, and I've played through three times the, the uh, since Friday. The thing for me though is it's it's people like you that make me want to play. I bought I well I didn't buy it, I rented it and then bought it from the rental company because I still wasn't quite sure. Still wasn't quite sure. But people that are die hard fans I'm a fan of Resi and have been for most of my life. I don't call myself a die hard fan anymore. Uh I just I I started playing different things. I didn't really feel the need to go back to Resident Evil and I never, I don't think I ever finished 4 I didn't like 5, 6 no so I was always <laughs> kind of dubious but when yeah, people and, like and correctly so, I mean yeah. I, I found Resident Evil lost its way once it got to 4 and you know, most people say that is the best Resident Evil game but if, if you think that's the best Resident Evil game you're not really a Resident Evil fan and especially 5 and 6 because they're not Resident Evil games, they're just they're, they're action only games by name. Yeah, they're they're very different. And that doesn't make them bad by default. I think no. four is excellent. I played five a little bit and was like, nope, not for me. And just cast off Resident Evil Six by reputation. I just yeah, didn't I, go there. I haven't just... touched six. I never have. I yeah. I pro I I kind of want to replay the games this year because obviously four, five, and six have been re-released on the newer consoles. Mm-hmm. And I've, and I've, I already own seven, so I wouldn't mind going through them again. It just makes me sad that I can't play Nemesis because I will say Nemesis is my favourite Resident Evil game. Right. Well, it goes about saying that Nemesis is going to happen now. Oh yeah, they because uh, Capcom have said, I've said yeah, it depends on how how well Resi Two's taking that. Well, lads, come on. You, yeah, you, you've shipped three million in your opening weekend. Let's. Yeah, well, it, it's wise to not overcommit, but this was always going to be a banker. People have been oh, screaming yeah, for it for years. And John, you've been a little bit quiet. I don't know what your experiences were with Resident Evil games. I presume you came in uh, quite late, if I remember, based on our conversation we had a couple of years ago about Part Seven. Yeah. You yeah. sort of came in at number five. Is that right? Uh, no, four was my first. Right, but you like the the newer type of games, right? Yeah, I, I liked four. I loved five and i accepted six for what it was considering right and someone looking in from the outside on those ones my understanding of them is that they are really good um multiplayer co-op experiences yep which gives them a unique uh reason to play them over the other ones that are strictly single player orientated and don't offer much apart from the initial campaign, unless you're hardcore enough to unlock the secret modes, like in the original Resident Evil 2, you have the Hunk and Tofu mode. But no, most people didn't 
unlock those are quite difficult to access and it's the same quite in is remake a, it's a bit of a fucking yeah well I, I never played hunk back in the day did you it, not it was, it was too much for me too much task of me i find resident evil games genuinely terrifying to play i i never thought i was a scaredy cat until i realized especially playing resident evil 7 and this one that's come out this week I think Resident Evil 7, I think, is slightly different. I, I find Resident Evil 7 terrifying. It might be the scariest game I've ever played. And I've played some fucking scary games in my time. Mm. Well, the, the thing is with Resident Evil games, and I'm perhaps not talking so much about 5 and 6 because they're more action orientated, but in general, there's two ways of playing those games. You can play them for the experience, so you explore every nook and cranny, you allow yourself to get scared. Um, you over collect things you're overly conscious about your, your inventory and whatnot well, and then there's the I'm not going to call it casual because it's not but people who are just playing it to get to the end like speedrunners and whatnot who take the game at face value break down all the elements to, to complete the game and take the scare factor out of it entirely so they're just playing it mechanically yeah and I think I always fell somewhere it, in the if middle. If you play it for the experience, it takes a long time. Yes. And it is quite tense. Whereas if you play it the other way, it, it's entirely different experience. And I think by default, when I play a Resident Evil game, I always fall into the first category. I'm slow and ponderous. I take the game in as it was intended. But then I don't want to do that again after I've finished it. I then want to, if I'm playing other playthroughs, I want to breeze through it. Uh, I don't want to be there all weekend grinding away at something I've already done. So yeah. with with Remake, as I say, I've played it three times, uh, twice with Leon, one with Claire. First time took me eight or so hours, loads of saves, very ponderous experience, but, but enjoyable. But I was conscious it was taking me far too long to do because I was exploring every room thoroughly and trying to tiptoe around monsters that you could otherwise just blow their heads off, but it would cost you ammunition. But you're being overly conscious about resource management. And then after I finished that, I watched someone do a speed run and do it just in over one hour. And I'm like, Jesus. You, can, you can breeze through most of this game. You don't have to interact with half of it, but it's just there. I'm not going to say it is filler, but they're, they're definitely padding the game out with things that you can completely ignore. Um, so the, there's two very distinct experiences there and I wish I had been able to play it one more time so I could have unlocked uh, hunk mode and given you guys the full Resident Evil 2 <laughs> experience but unfortunately I'm not quite there yet I've, but I've not seen the requirements what do you have to do to get the fourth survivor? basically you have to uh, complete it with both characters and then play through the B scenario with either of them and then you get uh, hunk so I'm one more playthrough away from that Okay, so you got I and B in both. Yes. Okay. Oh no, just one. So if you you do oh, okay. uh, scenario A with both, and then just do scenario B with one of them, and you get hunk. Ah, okay, fair enough. So you can get in with free playthroughs if you if you do well. Um, yeah. my most recent playthrough, a little bit of a brag, I managed to get S plus rank because uh, having learned the tricks of the trade by watching speedruns, I'm I'm nowhere near as fast as they are. It took me. Two hours 45, I think, or so, or maybe just short of two and a half hours, which by speedrunner territory is very, very slow. But yeah. by general completion rate, that's ungodly that's, fast. That's decent. That's I was, very good. I, I was just able to skip through so many things that I would have spent so much time doing otherwise. And it does make you, you realize that when you're playing just to get to the end, you do look at things very differently. And you spending a lot of time sort of admiring this world that Capcom have put you in, yeah. and allowing yourself to be scared of things that sometimes aren't even scary, but you kind of buy into the, the vision of what Resident Evil is supposed to be, and it's supposed to be a shit your pants scary, <laughs> semi action orientated game, and it certainly succeeds on that level if you want it to. Yeah. But you can break it down to its core elements and and whiz through it no problem at all, and I would. Highly recommend, if you are of a nervous disposition when you start playing Resident Evil 2 Remake, when you start the game, it goes through all this configuration bollocks about how 
bright your screen should be and adjust the levels down to this so you barely see it, you know, the type of things that you get on a lot of new games. Whack that motherfucker up to as bright as possible. Ignore I, the advice it's giving you because the game is very, very dark. I do that on every fucking horror game I play ever. It's I, yeah. I, I've told this story before. I think I told this story when you were on last time. I'd done that for Resident Evil 7. I turned the brightness all the way up and it was still really fucking scary. But the problem was, when I then went to play it in VR, I walked into the house, it was pitch black, I went, oh fuck, I forgot to turn the brightness up, realised because I've got a VR headset on, I can't. I went, nope, I am mm-hmm. not fucking playing that. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine what the VR experience it, dude, is like. Dude, it, it is the terrifying. most terrifying thing I've ever done. Uh, finishing that fucking game in VR took hours, and it was just brutal. But it was so much fun, and I I recommend everybody does it. Everybody that's got a VR headset should should do it. It's brilliant. I see the thing with the playthroughs for Resi for me. I I fall somewhere in the middle. I don't like playing a resource management game, but I don't want to finish it in an hour and twenty minutes. I'm trying to finish my first playthrough quickly, but it is so scary, and more importantly, actually, it's such an interesting build. Yes, yeah, ho- that's true. It's been put together so well, as much as I might be trying to run through sections, I want to look around. I want to play with stuff. I want to, you know, I want to read all the notes and I want to get all the secrets and I want to do all that. Yeah. So, whereas, like, you'll, you'll watch a, a fast run through be where I am in about 40 minutes. I'm like, well, I, it, it took me 40 minutes just to do this bit. Uh, well, this ain't going to work, is it? Because I want to finish it quick. But. I'm stuck playing with stuff, and it it's so fucking hard. It's so hard. Fucking zombies are so hard to kill. So, yeah, what, what are you struggling with specifically? Uh, you what, really partially played through it so far, right? At the moment, I'm I'm stuck. Kind. Of, it's not that I'm stuck. I'm kind of forcing myself to be stuck. If you know what I mean. I'm trying not to waste all of my ammo on every fucking zombie I see. Because I got stuck the first time I fought uh, Billy Birkin and ran out of ammo completely. <laughs> oh, oh well, that, that, that's the beautiful part, right? I don't know if you've actually bothered to watch a, a speedrun yet. And if you haven't, it's fine because it will spoil it for you. But <laughs> compared to like classic Resident Evil games, you get knives yeah. in uh, Resident Evil 7 and in, in Resident Evil 2 Remake. And that was in the old games absolute last resort i've spunked all my bullets i need to get out of a a tight situation here i'll try and kill something with a knife and usually it ends up costing you your life yeah whereas in resident evil 2 remake a knife is a god weapon yeah and not not for the reason you you probably think it might be i certainly wouldn't stand in front of a zombie and try and slash them with it but it, it serves two purposes one it can be used as a direct melee weapon which is fine don't use it against liquors and zombies because that would be suicide. Yep. And then it also acts as an extra life bar because if you have the knife equipped as a sub weapon and you get attacked face on by just about anything, you can break out of the attack by stabbing uh, the enemy, usually in the head, with a quick time event. Yeah. And that gets you out of a pickle, but then you've lost your knife uh, unless you kill that enemy and you can get it back. But it, it, it is a, an interesting lifesaver and it can be used as a health resource for that reason. But why I say it's a god weapon is not for, for that reason. It's because it's highly effective against um, enemies with massive hitboxes because you do these massive arcing swipes with the knife. Yeah. And if you're facing a character, particularly Birkin, who you fight four times in the game, no spoilers, <laughs> and three of those four times, you can attack him with the knife because he's... He's full of unnecessary animation where he's just sort of standing around, roaring his head off and not actually attacking you. You can just stand in front of him, repeatedly slash him with the knife, and it makes such a massive cut in motion. It goes through three or four hitboxes on him, and you can kill him very quickly just using the knife. Nice. And that that is the essence to, one, speedrunning the game well, and two, conserving shitloads of ammo you would otherwise be forced to extinguish on him because he is a massive bullet sponge yeah right. well that, that's the problem you see so I I think the first time I fought him I died uh, second time I fought him I lucked into finding an extra grenade and literally that's what saved me 
I had used all of my ammo and then had uh, that my last grenade killed him and that was it. What? Yeah. Killed well, grenade, grenades are very effective against the bosses. And again, yeah. they, they also function the same way as knives yeah. do. That if you have them equipped, they become your sort of breakout escape weapon if you get grabbed by something. But if you use a grenade for that purpose, it's a massive waste because you'll end up killing one zombie, which would yeah. take a massive amount of damage off a, an end level boss if you'd saved it and they're absolutely critical so people who are keen on good resource management tend to store them away in the in the item boxes until they know a boss battle is coming up because if you accidentally have it equipped and you end up using it on getting out of a zombie attack that will piss you off yeah <laughs> and uh, flashbacks yes yeah. yeah, i found particularly um it's not particularly been uh a standout feature of previous Resident Evil games, but they're very useful in this. If you're in a room with loads of zombies, you can flash all of them yep. and stun a whole room of zombies, or a boss, or Mr. X as he's chasing you. And there's a couple of instances whereby you absolutely can't get past Mr. X because he's cut you off, and yeah. you either have to take damage or you can flashbang him and get past him. Nice. So they are extremely useful yeah. to have. Do not waste them on shoving them down a zombie's oh, mouth no, no. to break out of the grab. No, absolutely, fuck no. No, but after I'm really enjoying it, but it is very hard, and I think a lot of it is me making it hard on myself. Uh, but I, I keep it's it's a kind of it's kind of a compact thing, a version of what I end up doing with like Assassin's Creed games. I want to get to the end of the story, but at the same time, I want to wander. <laughs> And I want to do everything else. And then I get about halfway through and go, I just need to get this fucking thing finished. And then yeah. hamstring myself and just run to the end. And that, I think, is what I'm going to end up doing with Resi 2. Not because I'm bored, but because I want to see it through to the end. And then I want to play it again. And again. Because I mean, you say you, you, never played as, uh, you never played the Force Survivor back in the day. I made it a point to... Like, I was an absolute arse. I didn't leave my bedroom for fucking days so I could perfect Resident Evil 2 and play as Hunk and play as Tofu. I never finished it as Tofu. That was suicide. Never happened. <laughs> well, Tofu's a bit more of an interesting experience because of this knife, me uh, knife mechanic we were just talking about. Yeah. Tofu's a bit more interesting now because you start the game with lots of these knives in your inventory. The Tofu can be quite dangerous. Yeah. Uh, compared to how you said, I mean, you can't um, proactively melee knife attack people well, but if you get grabbed, you can get out of a lot of tight spots because of the way the knife mechanic works. And, yeah. and Resident Evil 2 Remake, it's pretty cool. So uh, I imagine Tofu's a bit easier than it used to be, but I'm certainly not saying it's easy in general. <laughs> I will say the knife does one other thing that I really like. Uh, and when you use it as a sub weapon and you stab it into zombie, zombies in this game are assholes, and they pretend to be dead, and then they come back because they're yeah. fuckers. So the knife mechanic, because you can't get the knife back unless the zombie's dead. If you go anywhere near that zombie and your knife ain't ready to come back, you run off and shoot that bastard again. Yes. <laughs> yeah. the, the the better safe and sorry policy is always a, a shotgun to the head. Yeah. Uh, if if their head blows off, you, they're they're pretty dead. Yeah. Whereas you're never quite sure of a pistol. Uh, I I will say that it's probably my one complaint I think so far about Resi Remake is is the the kind of RNG nature of the health bar to the zombies. Yes. One one minute I can kill one with one shot to the head. Next minute I've unloaded an entire clip and he's still coming yeah. at me. Uh, it not all it... zombies are created equal. No, I'll they're not. I'll say that much. You will, you will learn as you go along when you come across repeat scenarios that certain zombies can be headshot once and their head will explode and others will take five or six to put yeah. down, uh, which is I, a little bit unfair. It does. Yeah, the un, un, I hate the word unfair because it is a game and it, it's how the devs wanted it, but it, do, it, it does feel a bit cheap my my rule of thumb and it's not an exact science is the skinnier the zombie the easier they are to kill there yeah. are some fat zombies in there oh, the fat zombies are great because they fall apart yeah. when you hit them with a knife right like, and, but they do take more shots to put down yes they so do. you have to be prepared for that and there's a distinctly chinese zombie model <laughs> 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 who, who it always takes loads of hits to go down right? 
I don't know why it's it's like they've done this weird character caricature of what a Chinese person looks like if they're a, an evil oh, person no. and just stuck it on a zombie. It looks so <laughs> fucking racist. <laughs> it sticks out a mile. I mean, we were talking offline the other day about um, certain zombie models being quite distinct and, and perhaps yeah. reusing some uh, assets from Resident Evil 7. And there's definitely one that has Mia's hair from Resident Evil 7 because it's Oh, yeah, there's, there's so definitely... It's got a yeah, there's definitely yeah. zombie Mia kind of running up the stairs after you, Mia, yeah. is there. You know, her hair enters the room before the fucking zombie does. Yes. That's how alive it is. <laughs> it's weird. Um, but you, you can you can get used to the, the sort of damage ratio required to put down certain creatures in the game. But as with Resident Evil 2 original, the lickers are probably going to give you more headaches than any boss. You'll find they take so many shots to kill... And they inflict such insane amounts of damage. And they're so quick. They are quick and very unpredictable. And they can hit you from super long range. Yeah. I mean, you can sneak past them, but that is nerve wracking because if you just press just ever so slightly too hard on the analog stick, you'll make a creak <laughs> and they will pounce on your ass and you're going to go down to red energy right away. They are yeah. motherfuckers. Yeah. It it's it is such a, it is a great game and a great remake and I I genuinely genuinely hope we get three because like I said three is my favourite the memories of like, traipsing in my PlayStation to friends' houses and we would carry on playing on my save to play through Nemesis I I loved three and I can't, I would love to play it again but <clears throat> but yeah I love the character model for Billy Burke and if they can do that in a in a new game for Nemesis, I think that's going to be amazing. Yeah, Birkin's uh, very cool, particularly once he gets to like phase four of his mutation. Yeah. It's just a little bit crazy, but it, yeah, it's very cool. And the fucking um, tyrant may be the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in a video game ever. Yeah, even when he's I mean, not on he, the screen and you can hear him wandering around. Oh, oh it's it's very very subtle. A yeah. <laughs> uh, m- bit more subtle than Nemesis because he was just cracking through walls every five minutes, just absolutely terrorizing you. At least, yeah. You kind of know at all times where Mr. X is in relation to how quickly you can move. Yeah. Um, the only problem is when you go into a room because you have to get something and come out, he's probably caught you up and you're in a bit of trouble. Yeah. But um, <laughs> there is a boss battle I won't spoil too much with with Mr. X at some point in the game. And the particular model used for that battle, he looks insanely good, especially as he starts to decay through damage. They did a really good job. And I think if I was to sort of summarise Resident Evil 2 Remake, because we've been talking about it for a while now. <laughs> yeah, we, we um, probably need to move on and wake John up at some point. Very beautiful looking game. Extremely well written. Um, I don't think it has as good character development as Resident Evil 7 and the fact that um, the Bakers made that game so much fun because of how quirky and weird they were. Yeah. Uh, you don't have those kind of characters in Resident Evil 2 Remake. Um, Leon and Claire are very, very likeable characters. They're both super sweet. And once you've played through the story, you'll understand why those couldn't be nicer people. But there's not there's not a lot of devil in them whatsoever compared to other Resident Evil characters yeah. like a Chris or, or an Albert Wesker or whatever. They're just pure, pure good guys. They're, they're very, very cool. Um some of the weaponry is a little bit hit and miss. Um, I didn't enjoy Claire's campaign as much as Leon's because her weapon set is mostly worse than Leon's, although the grenade launcher with flame rounds is spectacular. <laughs> but the acid rounds are really dull. Oh, no. Yeah. I didn't oh, get any satisfaction out of using acid rounds, but flame rounds, sweet. Oh, really that's, a, that's a shame. And I would say... One of the best features of the original PlayStation game was the music. It was absolutely yes. incredible. Uh, I wouldn't say it's as good in Remake. It's very atmospheric in its own right. But you can pay to download um, a Resident Evil 2 original music pack if you're nostalgic for that first game. Or you get it for free in the deluxe version, I think. So that's cool. But in general, you know, it's a monster smash hit without me having to say so. And um, If you are on the fence about getting it, 
I highly recommend it. And if Resident Evil 7 is anything to go by, it hasn't really come down that much in price. So if you're the kind of person who likes to wait a year to get a bargain, I don't think you will with this game. No. So no, if you no, don't no. want it spoiled to hell and back, you probably need to get on it sooner rather than later. Uh, if you can get it for like 35, 40 quid, I think you, you're onto a good deal there. You do I did. I rented it from Boomerang and then got it half price when I said, I just clicked the button and said, keep it. Nice. Cost me 22 quid. Very cool. <laughs> Even if I get frustrated to the point where I only finish it the once, it will be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's, that's definitely a good way of doing it. And John, I think there's enough action in the game to, to even uh, appeal to someone who's into Resident Evil 4, 5, and 6. I think you'll enjoy it. And because it's not a first-person shooter game, it is third-person over the shoulder like Resident Evil 4 and 5. So I think you, you'd feel right at home with it. And if you haven't played Resident Evil 2, the original, then you get to experience the story with fresh eyes, which would be pretty cool. So I'm actually renting it as well. Um, but the only reason to why I didn't play it this weekend, funnily enough, was because I was forced to play Anthem. Forced? Yeah. That's an interesting word. But uh, <laughs> I guess that is a, a time-sensitive uh, activity, so I, I kind of forgive you for that. Yeah. It's a good segue into talking about Anthem, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I definitely very, very professional. I yeah. definitely can't like go for the amount of time that you guys did for Resident Evil on Anthem because that would actually cover the entirety of gameplay you can put into Anthem over the course of the weekend that just happened. Cause so it how, did... how long did they give you, if you don't mind me asking? So, uh, so it was active from the Friday until about half past one in the morning, Sunday night. All right, so you got to play it as much as you wanted in that time. Yeah, you could play as much as you wanted in that time. Assuming as long you, as you could, could get actually on. get to playing it. Because oh. there were an awful lot of bugs. Oh no. Yeah. So, uh, I'll start with the biggest and most obvious bug, which did fix itself. I say fix itself. Bioware fixed it over the course of the weekend. Uh, the, if you were loading up the map to actually go and play, uh, occasionally the loading bar would hit 95% and then stop. Oh, that's frustrating. Yeah, but... You, it's it was quite obvious to tell because when the bar would reach about seventy eight ish percent, uh, it would then load like immediately and complete, or it would go so far and then it would jump to ninety five and then that was it. That was all you were getting out of it. And it was the only solution was to close it and then reopen it back up again. But as long as you were loading into an expedition or going to free play or something. If you reloaded the game, when you press the A button at the start of every game and it goes to connect to the servers, it comes up and tells you, you have an active expedition. Would you like to restart? Would you like to go back into it? And you just press yes. Yes, I would. And then, assuming you get past the 95%, it loads you into where you should be from playing. That's not so you bad. Don't, so you don't actually have to then go and reload and go back into walking around and then climbing into your javelin and relaunching the mission it just puts you back into the mission where you left it more or less assuming you were the person who started it or you're playing with people who aren't complete dickheads and just go off and play on the mission while you're reloading the fucking game so another one where you need to be playing with your mates uh so with the demo specifically you can play in private when doing missions Okay. And you can play with just yourself or you and up to three other friends. So while I was doing it, I was mostly playing with Lee, but I did have a spat with playing with Dunny on the Sunday night while staying up to watch the Royal Rumble. That was a mistake. <laughs> because you stayed up to watch the Rumble or because you stayed up late and had to go to work on Monday? I I went to work on Monday on one hour of sleep. Well, that would fucking teach you, wouldn't it? Yeah, I slept for 12 hours Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it wasn't even worth staying up for I saw the results to the rumble it wasn't even worth staying up for no it wasn't great <laughs> well, the, re the results were not were predictable and pretty shit but the actual, some of the matches were actually pretty good fair enough so with Anthem when I started playing it with Lee on Saturday was it it may have been Friday it was a day's evening when it was available when I was playing with Lee and 
Um, it was only unlocked that you had to play as the Raider class javelin suit, which is just the generic class. So is that just like an assault class? Yeah, so you're playing in a suit that's not the quickest, not the most durable, not the most damaging, um, but it's just the all-round good class uh, with some pretty cool weapons that it can pick up. So you can't have any of the particularly heavier weapons. Those are unique uh, to the Colossus class. Um, but it has a really good ultimate, which is just a um, multi-missiles, where you just, when you press up after charging the bar far enough from taking damage or dealing damage, it literally just targets everything in front of you and just fires missiles just at it all. Cool. But the best thing with that one is you can engage that while flying. Unlike most of the other ultimates where you're flying around, you can't engage it. Whereas that one, if you're flying along, you fly it just over the course of a load of enemies and just like lay waste to all of it. Nice. You basically turn yourself into a fighter jet. Pretty much, yeah. I like it. I I think I did that over the uh, while Lee was in pretty heavy combat at one point. I just flew over, and it's just like everything just blew up as I flew over it. And he said that was actually pretty cool. Nice. Um, Tell me then, about flying. So the flying is not always. You can't always be flying because you have a certain amount of. Um, you have a cooldown. It's not so much a cooldown. It's that if you fly for too long, your engines overheat, and then you kind of just crash into the floor. Fair enough. But you can change the the temperature of uh, your engines by flying close to water and I'm guessing that depending on if there's snow at some point in the game's map then you'll be able to fly for longer there because you're cooling down while you're doing it Okay. but some of the transitions so when I was playing with Lee we were just playing in free mode flying around and then we just saw a waterfall and we just flew straight into the waterfall turned out that it wasn't a waterfall it was actually a pipe going into the underwater tunnels Okay. And the, tra- the transition between flying in the air to being underwater and then back out into flying into air looks fucking gorgeous. Nice. So one thing Anthem really has going for it at the moment is that the graphics are pretty fucking good. And this is a demo which is actually significantly worse graphically than what the original trailers and the the demo that was put at E3 the two years ago okay showed off so is that because we've got a we've had a compressed demo or because it's you're playing on Xbox and they showed PC footage or so what I'm are thinking, we talking I'm thinking it's it is because it's compressed demo the compressed down to 23 gigabytes it's not really compressed is it no no, a 23 gigabyte <laughs> demo is the, well. 23 gigabytes is the size of most games used to be, like three years ago. Yeah. So a 23 gigabyte demo is pretty fucking big. So I think I don't know if it was HDR enabled or 4K yet in the demo. I can't imagine why they would do that. It'd be fucking stupid to do that. But a 23 gig download for a demo was crazy. Yeah. It took the best part of a day and a half to install. Jesus. (laughs) But my internet's been a bit iffy since City Fiber started going around laying down the new pipe. Nah, fair enough. Um, Is it good, though? Did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it. I thought the the four missions that you got were obviously not right at the start of the story. They were a good couple of missions into the story. Yeah. Um, Well, actually, more than just a good couple, because... uh, if, like Lee, you were playing without subtitles, you had no idea who was talking half the time. But I was playing with <laughs> subtitles, and as the subtitles go along, it tells you who's talking. Yeah. And seeing as you only really know yourself and the one character you meet in the story, which is just some bald guy. Yeah. Seeing as they're the only two people you know, when you start seeing other names showing up and not those two people... You kind of don't really know what the fuck's going on. Like, Who the fuck is that? Yeah. So, yeah. So it's a bit hit and miss story-wise, but that's only because four missions worth of gameplay. 
um, after level 12 and at the end on Sunday, actually, um, they at level 12, they give you the option to pick another javelin class out of the other three, which are Storm, Colossus, and Interceptor, which pretty self-explanatory what they can do. Two of those are X-Men. Yeah. Why are they naming their javelins after X-Men? I don't know. Fuck so you, the Storm, EA. The Storm class is more elemental based, so they've got powers of uh, electric, fire, and uh, ice. Still an X-Man. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. <laughs> the, the Colossus is your heavy ordnance kind of class, where they've got the big hulking armor. They're not, they're not particularly quick, but they are powerful. They do have one massive flaw, in that they so don't self um, regenerate health or armor. You have to run over charging uh, packs after killing enemies. Okay. But one of the the, the when you double tap when you press the two shoulder buttons together you perform a special uh, which for the Colossus while I was using it was a battle cry which made all of the enemies in the radius of the battle cry um, drop down drop immediately their um, health cores yeah so hit the battle cry mow everything down with the minigun or a mortar or the rail gun that you've got or the, the heavy grenade launcher that's on your back that fires basically nukes Nice. And then you just pick up all the fucking health and you're fine. <laughs> um, you, the Colossus class also doesn't have a dodge mechanic because it's just a big hulking it's just a machine. Tank. It's a big tank. So instead of having a dodge mechanic, what it has is a shield. So you just like pull a big fucking piece of metal out and put it in front of you. Nice. So that's kind of cool. Um... And then there's the Interceptor class, which is the one that most videos, if you've watched any Anthem stuff, people are using to do crazy flips and shit. And pretty the so the Storm class has the longest flight time because it uses its own ice to cool its engines while flying. Cool. But the Interceptor has the fastest flight and can do the most ev evasive maneuvers. Nice. Um. With the Interceptor when floating around and doing said evasive maneuvers, you can actually get some pretty cool looking um, man uh, thing moving around. But it's more of a duck and dive. So you, you fly in, do a couple of hits, disappear off for a bit, come back and keep doing that over and over. So mm -hmm. you're, you're basically a hornet floating yeah. about, just stabbing everything and then running away. Fair enough. So I'll let you guess clearly that I picked the Colossus class out of all of those because yeah. big motherfucking cannons. That's just what you do. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm there to make sure everything else blows up. Yeah. Um, there's a pretty cool mechanic to Anthem which uh, separates it from a lot of other... I say a lot of other... It separates it from Destiny specifically. Okay. Um which is combos and combinations of what you're doing. So there's a couple of uh, interest, uh, interesting things with it is that there's a couple of different attack types, as it were. So it's um, the, like basically the primers and detonators is the way that they, they put it down in the you can prime enemies using certain moves. So, for instance, fire, ice, and acid, and electric okay. type things are often primers. So they'll you hit an enemy with the, the Colossus, there's a, a firewall mortar where you launch the mortar and it just puts a big wall of fire. Anything in that fire is considered primed. And then you hit them with a detonator. So, for instance, the railgun's a detonator. It's an Im it hits with impact. Or you hit them with uh, you know, an ice detonator or a light, big lightning strike from the storm or something, something like that. It's like frag grenades from the radar class. And it deals uh, even more damage. But with it is that if you prime and do your... If you do your own prime and detonate, 
it deals, uh, from what I've seen at the moment, double damage. But then if you prime and someone else detonates, it deals triple damage. So right. it tries to get you to work as yeah. a team to do it. And I've seen some pretty nasty prime and detonate. So when I was playing with Lee, we came across a big motherfucking enemy. This is like a big fucking stompy robot with essentially uh, a blast door for a shield. Yeah. Uh, and he hit it with like an ice primer. And then I pulled out my siege cannon and just smashed it with that. And <laughs> that thing did not last. No. Uh, so with the demo so far, after you've done the four missions, you can then just mooch about in the free play. And in free play, the game is where it really comes alive because the missions themselves are just generic story missions. Go to yeah. point A, stand around in a circle for a little while with waves of enemies coming at you. Go to point B, kill a couple of enemies, grab relic complete yeah type jobs was the free play is you can just float about find little strong a little um areas to go into you go into them you kill all of the enemies in the in the cave you work your way through it open up a couple of chests while you're in there get some xp kill some more enemies have a bit of fun and then go back to uh i can't remember the name of the place the, the 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 tower equivalent. Wow, I can't believe I've forgotten it already. Uh, and then just take a look at the stuff that you've picked up. So you'll pick up a load of uh, relic, a uh, load of relics, a load of new weapons, some upgrades, some better gear than you're currently wearing. And you just like attach it onto your javelin. So different weapons. So at the moment, I've got a, uh, I've taken a fancy with my Colossus to the auto cannon, which is a, basically a mini gun. Yeah, and my other weapon is usually a marksman rifle for because they do pretty decent single shot damage and are relatively accurate. Okay. So when you're running around with a minigun, you kind of want to have the ability to shoot at distance accurately yeah. because otherwise you're not going to do anything as soon as it goes over a certain distance. Uh, and there is um, in the forge, which is where you do this stuff with your javelin, is the ability to change the paint scheme and the the colors of what your outfit your your javelin looks like yeah i've seen some videos of some pretty leery pink javelins flying around yeah so a lot of people out there have gone for like really cliche i'm going to go with iron man and it's going to be red with gold including a lot of people with colossus ones and they just said i've made the hulkbuster yeah why not yeah it, it was going to happen I'd it's rather that, Marvel think. DLC incoming. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would rather go around dressed like not quite the Hulkbuster than, the, like I say, Larry Pink ones I've seen that make, make these people look like rampant rabbits. Yeah. So from what you know of me, what do you think I've got as my colour scheme? Purple and yellow. Yep. <laughs> it's literally the arm, the the the, the armour pieces that I've got on the chest area kind are mostly purple with yellow highlights to the uh, under the smaller bits of armour around it, and then the bodysuit underneath is white. Nice. So I'm full on Minnesota Viking, going around as you should be. Yeah. See, when you said you were purple and yellow, I thought you were like doing a skeletal tribute. <laughs> <laughs> Go, go with that next time. Yep. I'm purple know, and yellow I'm, because Skeletor. I'm happy knowing the Minnesota Vikings on this one. <laughs> but it, to be fair, you'd do a similar thing with blues and whites. I tend to go blue, white, and then purple just because Saints Row. Yep. Uh, but the, so the javelins themselves are pretty cool to just fly around in, use, blow things up. And then there's the Destiny equivalent for strike missions which are the strongholds mm -hmm. and the stronghold in the demo is fucking hard when he, um, Bioware went out and said there's a reason to why we don't allow you to do private strongholds is that they're designed for four people 
Yeah. And loads of people complain, saying, oh, but I can do this much um, on my own. How hard is it going to be for me and my two friends to do it? And I did one of the strongholds. I've only completed one so far from playing it. Uh, okay. It's The first bit is pretty easy. You can do it on your own. You just fly around. You collect six uh, relics, deliver them to a point, kill a load of enemies while you're at it. Yeah. Job's done. The next bit, where you have to collect 12 relics with uh, the scorpions, as they are, which are weird little spider creatures, um, trying to stop you from doing it. But the 12 that you collect, you can only collect one at a time instead of three at a time. But you also can't fly when you're carrying them. Okay. So you 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 have to then sprint around after picking them up. So this is where you definitely need more people. Because after you've delivered the sixth one, you no longer get scorpions attacking you. You get um, scars, which is one of the factions who are essentially... Uh, the junkyard guys from either the division or infamous one. Okay, yeah. So they're kind of like going around in scrapped javelins, rather than um, fresh, clean, really nice ones from the city. So they're like the outcasts essentially. Um, and it, <laughs> they actually battle really fucking hard. They're the ones that actually have the the guys with the big fucking shields. Yeah. And those things you just can't shoot through them. You have to, you have to hope that they show off part of them because they also usually have big fucking cannons or flamethrowers on them, and they can be a bit of a bastard to try and kill. Um, and then after that one, you move into the final area where you go up against the scorpion, insect, spider things, and the boss in the area is a big motherfucking spider insect thing which has four massive bars of health. And each time you deplete one of its four massive bars of health, it disappears off, and you end up with a massive wave of about 50 of the uh, of the scorpions coming after you. Um, that's not fun. No. Because that happens a lot. And then when it comes back, all you get to know is that the screen starts shaking a little bit, your controller vibrates, and then all of a sudden you've got this big motherfucking thing hitting you from behind and almost killing you straight away. Nice. So the thing's fucking it's bastard hard. Yeah. It's fun, but it's bastard hard. Is it going to drag you away from Destiny? Uh, I don't actually play Destiny that much anymore. I I I was looking forward original announcement. I was looking forward to Anthem. I thought, yes, it's going to be essentially Mass Effect beats Destiny meets Lost Planet. And I thought it was going to be great. But the, the closer it's gotten to Anthem's release, the less interested I've been in it. And I was chatting to Lee and a couple of others, and we're just looking at it going, not sure if we want to get it on launch because we've seen the price drops for it. and yeah. It briefly was down as low as 30 quid. I think you can get the Legion of Dawn edition, which is the special edition, which the difference between that and the standard edition is four skins and the yeah, four skins. music Yes, <laughs> you get you get foreskins. <laughs> if, if, everyone likes a good foreskin. But you also get the uh, a digital copy of the music from the game, and it's a Bioware game, so the music's pretty fucking good. Okay. Um, uh, but I've seen that on CD keys drop to like forty five quid, which is cheaper than buying the game standard edition Jesus. would be on. Pretty much any other platform, bar CD keys. Yeah. So, I think I was tempted to buying the Legion of Dawn edition, but after looking at the difference between that and the standard edition, even if, even if the Legion of Dawn edition is like five pound cheaper than just buying it regularly. Yeah. On CD keys, I'd rather just buy the standard edition because I don't see enough of a difference between the two to warrant going for the extra fifteen pounds essentially. No. It's not fifteen pounds worth of extra content. I like listening to the music in the game, but I can't remember the last time I listened to a video game soundtrack when I wasn't studying. Yeah, no, fair enough. Jesus, yes, uh, forty nine quid down from eighty on CD yep. keys. And it's not even out yet. No, although CD keys were selling the VIP demo for nineteen for nine pounds last week, and then ninety nine pence on the weekend. I think on Sunday. It was being sold for 99 pence. 
Yeah, so I see people have done that forever. I remember watching someone sell Evolve beta codes uh, back in the day on eBay. What? I was going to say, weren't they actually, didn't they actually just get to a point where they were just giving those away to <laughs> literally much. anyone? Nobody wanted to play Evolve, which is why it eventually went fucking free. That was a weird, weird concept, Evolve. Yeah, it was. A- asymmetric um, PvP games are a really cool idea if you use the right mechanic, and I don't think giant stompy monsters versus four people is the right mechanic for it. Yeah, I mean, in fairness, Friday the 13th managed to pull it off much better. Yeah, but that's because, you know, Jason. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but even did. that was uh, quite unsuccessful sales-wise, right? Yeah, it, it didn't do well at all. It was a much better game than Evolve, I, I think, but it didn't do well at all. What was the other horror-based one again? Dead uh, by Daylight? Yeah, I've not played Dead by Daylight. I, Apparently I that, that one's got a really to- toxic community because people will just report anyone who wins as the guy on their own. <laughs> Because they say that whatever mechanic they use to win is against the the terms of service of the game because it had to be cheating in order to win. It's Yay, like, gamers! But it's like he the, he had to have been using the mechanics in the game because it's in the game. Uh-huh. Fuck's sake! <sighs> people are assholes. I yeah. hate people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. But the VIP demo for. Anthem was just free if you've got EA Access this weekend. Yeah. Or Origin Access. And it goes uh, free for all this weekend, doesn't it? Yes. So It's interesting because before, before you talking about Anthem then, I was completely disinterested in it, but you've actually managed to make it sound pretty cool. I, I honestly download the demo because you can now. So it's actually ready because it's a 24 gig download. <laughs> For Friday, just to give it a quick bash, just it's it's going to be my recommendation at the end of the show for people to play it. But seeing as no one will be listening to the show before the demo ends, true. It's it's worth playing just for the the sheer f- just pissing about in a beautiful world, and then smashing things to pieces with a giant stompy robot. Well, I tell you Sweet. what, mate. I'll gladly install it and have a bash with you because I'm not going to be in any fit state to play horror games and jumping out of my skin Friday. So, Puff. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, hopefully you you'll be online on on Xbox. I'll be online. Lee will be online, and then we can just like have a nice nice chill out session, just gas bagging, playing the game as it should be. Because as we've proven on so many games of co op based, including Destiny is that you need to be playing with people that you like playing yeah, I, with. I can't play those games on my own. I get really fucking bored. <laughs> it's like, you you play the game on your own. It's not that interesting. You play with random people. It's slightly better, but you do need to be playing with people that you can just, well, chat shit with for yeah. a couple of hours. And you kind of then wonder, hang on a second, we've been playing this game for about seven hours, we've done maybe one mission because we spent the entire time ripping into the fact that Lee's running around with a pink suit on. Nice. And I'm the puff. <laughs> 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 so you'd recommend you'd, it then, yeah? Yeah. yeah. I, I do recommend playing the demo at the very least. Maybe not spending 40 quid on the game. Maybe not. definitely not spending 80 quid on the game. Yeah, if if three weeks before it comes out you can buy a digital code for it 30 quid cheaper than retail I would give it some time I think that maybe its biggest issue, especially with CD keys, is that CD keys can sell it for stupid cheap the same way that, have you seen some of the the stuff that's coming out for Fallout 76 I mean, let's be fair about it Fallout 76 isn't a good example for anything, no no, but I think this one's going to amuse you if you've not seen it, is that in Germany, Fallout 76 editions of, I think, the Xbox One yeah. come with a free copy of Fallout 76. Wow. So you get the digital copy in the box, but they're also giving away the physical copy with the console. Jesus. <laughs> that went down well, didn't it? <laughs> the, in America, Literally can't the, the, give that game away. <laughs> 
Well, that's the thing. They're trying so badly. In America, um, I think it was at Target stores, the Tricentennial edition of it was being sold for $30. Jesus. I I love Bethesda, and I have an awful lot of time for Bethesda. They really fucked that up. This game's been out for two and a half months, and they're... And, um, yeah companies uh, can't get rid of the stock that they've got because they probably bought a fucking lot of it thinking it's Bethesda, it's Fallout, people are going to buy the shit out of it yeah. and they just didn't. Jesus. Wasn't even remotely tempted. I never am by Fallout games. The only reason I played it is because Bethesda were kind enough to send me a copy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was really well, that, sad. That's the result, isn't it? Well, then I was sad that the one and only time Bethesda have sent me anything, it was a fucking Fallout game, <laughs> and it wasn't even a good one. It was a Fallout game that they sent you a disc that basically just contained the unlock code for downloading it from oh, yeah. their servers. It still had a fifty gig download. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's every game these days. It's just a, yeah. a, a CD license on a on a disc. You're rarely installing anything. But yeah, that. Uh, that yeah, but I, I, a little bit. I'd expect for a, a game like Fallout, where the 50 gig download wasn't the entire game with a 200 meg installer from the disc, I'd I'd I'd, I'd, I'd I would think that they would put the map on the fucking disc. Well, or you'd hope the so. very small, like uh, even just like the the tiniest little thing that they could possibly get away with putting on there that wasn't just the ability to download it off of the internet. But as it was an entirely online game, what well, you can't really expect people to not download it. Nah. Well, if Bethesda are listening, I still love you, and when Doom Eternal comes out, I will gladly take a copy of that for review. I don't love you. I, I never have, and probably never will. Fuck you, John. <laughs> no one cares what you think. I care. Well, you just go play with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. So, Anthem Demo was good. Anthem Demo was good. Cool. Uh, did anybody else play anything else? No, I have been 100% stuck in Raccoon City this week. Sounds fair. I did do uh, my Hitman elusive target this morning. Just because it was there. That was fun. That's literally all, all I have to say about it. By the t- You're getting a lot of uh, value out of Hitman every time I listen to the show. You, you're talking about Mate, how much I, fun you're having with it. I genuinely, I, the, I think the best thing I ever done was get that game and grab the Legacy Pack while it was free because the Legacy Pack allows me to play through the Hitman One campaign in Hitman Two. So the the updated visuals, the updated mechanics, all of that, and it, I just I can't stop playing it. Like I, I was saying to you earlier, every time I, I switched on me. Me Xbox. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to play anything else. I just want to, I want to switch on Hitman and play through this map for the 14th time because I want to find something different to do. And I do. Uh, considering, I mean, I bought the gold edition that comes with a season pass and that. So I, I spent 80 quid on that game. I've got my 80 quid worth out of that game easily. And they haven't even announced any of the actual proper expansions yet. So. I'm quite a happy chappy when it comes to Hitman, but I'm I'm determined to play, at least play, if not succeed in doing all of the elusive targets for this one, because I missed the load in first. So yeah, there have been three, and the third one is on at the moment and finishes on Sunday, so I've done it this morning. But that's all I've been playing. Hitman and Resident Evil. Uh, I suppose... Um, I, I can mention Battlefield Five. I played a little bit because they've got a new... For this month's, well, this next two months, uh, Tides of War that they've got going on is they've introduced a new game mode. And by new game mode, what I, they actually mean is they're bringing back Squad Conquest from, I think, Battlefield 4. Yeah. Had Squad Conquest on it. So yep. the, the, no, wait. It, I think it was 3, actually. 3 so and 4 the, both the, had Squad Conquest. The, the 12v12 small maps. But the thing is, is that there are no small maps on Battlefield 4. No. Battlefield Five, sorry, there's, there's no small. So they've just got big maps, so they just grabbed small sections of. Uh, wow. 
it's not fun. But you have to play it for this month's Tides of the first two weeks worth of Tides of War because there are challenges attached to playing in Squad Conquest. That's Luckily, right. those challenges are things like play three rounds of Squad Conquest, win a round of Squad Conquest, and get five thousand points in Squad Conquest. Okay. Easy not, enough. Not, not not in one game of five thousand points. That is that's just get five thousand points total. Fair enough. And I also played the new game mode on Call of Duty Black Ops is Blackout, which you might like, Brooker, because it's not one and done. It's uh it's got a squad revive mechanic. Okay. So if you die and or rather if your entire team dies bar well squad dies bar one, the next time the map gets its warning for shrink, um, you get re added back into the game. In pretty much in the dead center. How does it deploy you back into the game? Do you parachute so, back in or just yes. spawn? Basically, another helicopter flies over, and everyone who was on the helicopter, which can be like 30 people, all get dropped in basically right in the middle of the map with a pistol. <laughs> so you Aww. control people pretty hard by just waiting for the the new helicopters to come in and just wait for them to parachute down and nail them. Yeah. Oh, lovely. So you, you do get a, sm- a small amount of window where you can just go land somewhere else. So I've pa- I've had to parachute in a couple of times because I've died pretty early. One time was actually because my friend searched while I was out of the fucking room. So I died right at the start because I didn't get back in time to stop myself from dying in the first wave. So I, I came back in. Uh, but every time the map reloads the next wave of people... It puts down more equipment on the floor. So you can go in, clear a building of gear, put get a load of really good stuff, wait for the next round of uh, of spawns, and then go back into that building and just pull more stuff out of it. Because there might be better stuff in there this time than the last time. Mm, that sounds pretty cool, but I've only played solos, so this isn't going to apply to me at all. So, uh, you'd be surprised the number of people who play squads on their own. Oh, yeah, quads. yeah, I've not even tried that, to be honest, but maybe I should. But, um, they, they have another um, game coming out in the next week or so. I can't remember what it's called, but it essentially reduces um, the weapon set to uh, sniper rifles and equipment, I think. Fucking hell. Using sniper rifles is fucking hard as it is. I yeah. suppose if everyone's using sniper rifles, you'll probably be a lot more fun. It's certainly going to be difficult. <laughs> but, uh... I I know that my best ever game of Blackout was one where I went to Nuketown Underground and I picked up the Bowie knife. And then I decided to not bother using any other weapons for a little while and I just ran around stabbing everyone. I got 11 kills. Yeah, I, I like uh, close quarters combat and, and Blackout. I use a lot of weapons most people would consider to be trash, like the Mozu, which is the, basically a magnum. I think I use the most once. Revolver. If you get that, um, if you get it decently equipped out, so you've got fast reload and uh, long barrel and some foregrips and stuff, it absolutely smashes people uh, when you get into the. You can wipe them out if you land all six shots. Well, it's, in quick succession. It's the same. I actually really like the uh, the garrison. Um, for burst pistol for the exact same reason is that if you've got it early and you can get enough attachments to it especially the the fast change magazine that gun's pretty fucking rampant at taking enemies down at close quarters yeah that's a good one uh, pretty much any 9mm fast firing weapon or the 45 cal fast firing weapons are just invaluable especially at the end game if you're at the end and it's just you and a couple of others as long as your gun fires faster than your opponent's, you're going to win. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, the Spitfire was so OP when the game first came out. It's been toned down a bit, but it's either the Spitfire or the, the Saug are kind of essential for close quarters in the final circle. Uh, not a fan of the Demon since they added that, or the SWAT. I think the SWAT's been a bit, bit pointless. I think the SWAT is st- statistically the most balanced weapon. Uh, in yeah. the game, it's it's decent at long range and very powerful at short range. But unlike you, John, I, I don't get on with it particularly. I much prefer an ICR. 
Yes, the ICR or the KN, both much better weapons. But yeah, I I've seen more SWATs on the floor than anything else in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, sounds about right. I mean, the the meta is is constantly changing and 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 blackout in a couple of weeks' time. We could all be using something most people don't go for, like a, a vapor or a Maddox, which are kind of useless at this point. But they'll just tweak one thing down and tweak something else up, and that's a, a total rebalance of the game. And everyone's got to find what works best for them again, which. I think it's actually a good thing about Blackout because if we were just using the same two weapons from day one, it would get dull very quick. But it's forcing people to experiment and find weapons for certain scenarios that work best. And I'm not a good sniper. Um, so <laughs> I, I don't getting think good a good short, sniper on that. Yeah, really. getting good the at short range. bullet drops a bit too aggressive. Yeah, yeah the projectile uh, drop is quite severe. But um, yeah. Getting good at close quarters combat is fun, and especially since they made the brawler perk a one hit kill, that's a lot of fun. You can like run into a room where you know people are camping and just melee them with a, a good good punch and wipe them out. It's, it's good stuff. And the little challenges as well when you're picking up the random items around, so the poker chips, and then you have to top three place with 15 health items on your yeah. person. <laughs> and, and yeah not often easy to do but uh, they are fun to go after especially like the ones where there's the, the burnt doll that you need for fire break and you have to kill someone with a molotov and then finish with that item in the game whether you win it or just die but it's quite difficult to kill people with molotovs yeah. so that is quite a challenge or downing someone and then finishing them off with a grenade <laughs> A little bit of overkill. It's just, it's just crazy. Especially because no one's ever going to leave someone long enough to kill them with a grenade. You would think. That, so, that, that sounds like something you're going to have to artificially set up. It's not yeah. going to come about naturally very often. No, probably not. You probably would need to... Although there's probably plenty of people out there who have managed it. I think I've only managed to get the, the special costume for Torg. Um, which I think is actually one of the easiest ones to do. Yeah, I've... I was I was stuck with him and the South African guy whose name escapes me. They're the big, thick, burly dude. I was stuck with those two costumes for ages, and then suddenly I played one game and just unlocked loads of them for some reason. I don't particularly remember doing anything, but I just, you know, you get that that chime when you know you've unlocked something. Yeah. And then I went into the character select screen, and I had character unlocked <laughs> all of them through in one game. I don't know how I did it. It might have been a bug, but... Uh, they have gave them out. All the characters oh. are now available, um, but you can still do the challenges because it gives you uh, a numbers skin, where basically you are covered... You, the, the outfit you're wearing is covered in the numbers from, yes. from Black Ops 1. There you go. That makes sense now. Yeah, I think people were whining about the fact of how difficult it was to unlock the characters, so they just gave everyone all of the characters and then just said, here you go, here's all the characters, now you unlock skins instead, and then change the requirements for the skins. The one I'm working on at the moment is one of the harder ones to get because it requires getting a specific weapon that you can only get by completing specific challenges that aren't always available. Yeah, like those Blight Father things that hang around at the graveyards and stuff. Yeah, or the the one the one I'm at the moment is you have to go to firing range. You need to pick up a pistol and you need to shoot six targets, but the six targets that you need to shoot aren't always there. So yeah. the last four times I've attempted it, I've never had six targets. It's always been four or five. Yeah, so the firing range just happens to be the busiest place on the map. Yeah, so uh, a good chance of dying. I'm just happy that uh, the boat is no longer the most because. That was always a fucking nightmare trying to go there because it's really close quarters, but there's always loads of fucking gear. Yeah, I've not actually spawned there, um, apart from when it first came out, and I was doing it out of curiosity and just seeing how often I could survive that first wave. But um, yeah, I don't really occupy that kind of. I tend to to drop into houses that have a hole in the roof because they're usually loaded with gear. 
and uh, uh, you're kind of reasonably safe there unless people follow you in but if you're quick you can get the first weapon and, and wipe a few people out before you, the game really got started so yeah there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of strategy to to black out uh, drop areas yeah it, it all depends, depends on, on what the style current meta is <laughs> The meta and your personal playing style, whether you, you like to play aggressive and go for kills early on or more tentative and sort of loot up before you start getting into action. But that's a good thing about it. There's, there's a way to play Blackout for everybody. And I think to to get good at the game and to win more often, you, you do need to have a certain amount of aggression. But you can do quite well consistently by being tactical and, and stealthy, which... Is going to suit some players better than others, so I think that's a good thing. It's nice that the maps, the map itself, is built almost entirely out of Black Ops historical maps. So there's the Nuketown area, there's the Estates area. So it's either a, a section of the single player story or a map from the multiplayer. And I think that going forward, a battle royale mode in, say, uh, an Infinity Ward version of Call of Duty would be interesting if they were to tie it into the Modern Warfare franchise because lots of people love the Modern Warfare maps to an extent where building a a Battle Royale mode around a map built entirely out of that many maps that everyone loves, especially Terminal, seeing as it's been on every fucking Call of Duty game by the Infinity Ward team since its inception. That, yeah, you're right. The future is there in Battle Royale. Very expensive, though, for Call of Duty to do it. Yeah, but uh, they've got the money. And, yeah, a modern warfare-themed Battle Royale game would just send people crazy. That would be so cool. (laughs) (laughs) Just just wondering if you were still awake, Brooks. I'm still here. I I don't have anything to add to the conversation, so I was just listening in. Yep. Well, we've we've all had a good good turn at having a good good yapper. Yeah, man. Seems like a good spot to wrap it up. Does uh, before we disappear, does anybody have any recommendations for the three people that are listening? And them. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm obviously going to recommend Resident Evil 2 remake, and I would say again, if you find that it's too intense and it's too scary, particularly when you're getting chased by Mr. X, I read a lot of comments online saying, "Oh, I wish he wasn't in the game, or I wish you could put him down for longer." So just just watch a speed run, learn the little nuances of the game, where you can get past things, what's the correct way to approach certain enemies. It will just make your life far less stressful. Imagine saying, That's my recommendation. Imagine playing Resident Play Evil. Play that. Watch a speed run. Imagine playing Resident Evil and going, "I don't want, I don't want the tyrant in the game." Fuck off. <laughs> oh, I find it incredibly <laughs> stressful. It's one of the reasons why it took me so long to complete the first oh, time. Oh, yeah, around. absolutely. To scare the living crap out of me. But to not want him in the game? Nah. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't go to that extent. But I wish uh, at certain points when I first played it, I wish he wasn't yeah. quite so persistent in his pursuit. Oh, yeah, he's he's intense. There's, there's no getting it, away from uh, that. Once you've you've done it once, it ceases to be an issue because you just learn how to how to deal with it properly. Yeah. Uh, and actually, because the new lists for like games of gold and PS Plus and that are out this week, so from Tuesday, I'm going to stick with my theme. From Tuesday on PS4 for free, you can pick up season one of Hitman. Yeah, Hitman. So. Mm-hmm. So if you've got Actually, P- Lee, Lee texted me about that today, saying how he just bought it. And I, did th- I did. I did. I did think about Lee <laughs> when I saw that. It did make me laugh. Uh, I I was tempted to text him just to get a giggle out of it, and thought, no, best not. That'd be mean. I'm not that big of a cunt. Here you are. Well, I am. Yeah, I am. <laughs> but yeah, uh, from Tuesday, Hitman is available on PS4, uh, on PS Plus, and I cannot recommend it enough. It's absolutely brilliant. That I think. Is that so, gents? Until the next time, Matt. Where can people find you? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Lambo Matt with one T, and my retro gaming podcast, the Retro Gaming Discussion Show. We just put out uh, an episode in celebration of Resident Evil Two re- remake. We revisited the original Resident Evil. Uh, that twas, episode came out. It was a damn week. good episode too. Thank you very much. We had a, a lot of fun doing it. We were very immature. 
as standard, <laughs> given that we were very young teenagers when that game came out and a lot of uh, innuendo associated with that yeah. game. But uh, yeah, it was cool. So uh, go check that out if you, you fancy a dip back into Resident Evil. Cool. John? Uh, yeah, um, so you can find me on Twitter as the John underscore CU and Xbox Live as Long Dong Silver. My cool. favourite gamer tag. Of- <laughs> <laughs> brilliant uh, and yeah you can find me on Twitter I'm at brook411 uh, that's pretty much it for me uh, as a podcast we are at character unlock on everything so Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and if you don't want to follow us on any of those and just want to talk to us or just want to listen to us again we will be back in a couple of weeks uh, Matt, dude it's awesome having you on always, and we're going to have to get you on more often than once every two years. Oh, the, the only problem is I'm I'm so casual the, these days when it comes to new stuff. The only <laughs> thing I played since the last time I was on was FIFA and Call of Duty. So <laughs> not a shitload to talk about, unfortunately. Wow, but uh, yeah, whenever there's something new out, I think I'll be getting um, Sekiro: Shadows Die Twice next. So I'll probably come and talk to you about that one. Nice. I'd be curious. I don't think I'll be grabbing that one. It might it might be a bit much for me. Uh, oh, actually, saying that, a complete tangent. But did you see uh, Bloodstained is going to be on Games for Gold from Friday? Nope, it's that one. What is it? No, no, no. I don't know I was, what it is. But I, was I, say. I wasn't aware that it was coming out. So, <laughs> I was going to uh, say, I, fucking I hell! That. Please know what Bloodstained is. <laughs> no, no, I know what it is. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I wasn't aware. So yeah, that'll be. Yeah, I might it, actually be a game of gold I might actually play. Yeah, uh, me too. To be fair, <laughs> so I went, oh yes, I'll be adding that, that one. Download every one of them and never touch them again. <laughs> yeah, I do, this, I do the same. I, I downloaded Steep this morning on PS4 because I forgot to get it last month. I thought, I'm never going to play Steep. It's shit. But I now own it because it was free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is this, uh, this itching obligation to, to grab anything that's free because... Wouldn't it be nice to go into your games list and see this massive library of stuff you could play that probably never will? At least with Xbox, when they give you older games, it's because they're backwards compatible and you could play them. Whereas I still add the PS3 games to my library, even though I haven't plugged in a PS3 for four years. It's kind of nice that they're still doing that, though. There's a, there's a bit of a commitment there for some reason. Yeah, I think it goes it next on month. The, uh, Next, well, there you go. Next month, I think it'll be, stop. The, it'll be the Vita next. We're all in trouble. I I think the Vita and the PS3 games both stop in March. I might Oof. be wrong. It's rough. We just lost the Wii Store. Yeah, Early. that goes today or something, doesn't it? That's is it today or yesterday? The Wii yeah, Store goes. Yeah, there's some goes. classics that are going to be lost in the Wii Store, particularly the stuff that they deleted ages ago that you just can't get anymore. But uh, this, yeah, this the Wii will bit... cease to be useful. This is where I argue against, as much as I buy them myself, this is where I argue against digital storefronts. You know, what happened to all of these games that you can't get anymore because they're digital only or they're on storefronts that now no longer exist? You know. It's a risky take, and, and we oh. should all know by now that Nintendo are, are greedy bastards and will screw oh. you over, whereas Xbox are a bit more committed to being consumer friendly about these things. Yeah, I, th- I think this is what puts Xbox. Uh, slightly above PlayStation in my estimation is that they do kind of they are making it so that the, the next game next console I'll be able to play all my games on as well you know I'm and I'm all for that but yeah you know, digital libraries as much as I I spend a fortune on digital games I still think physical's the better way to go you know 30 years time mate your retro collection's going to be a bit shit if it's all on a li- all on a digital library isn't it I don't buy digital video games <laughs> For all that reason. Yeah. Anyways, that I think is is us done. Gentlemen, uh, let's say, Matt, it's been great. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me, guys. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Until the next uh, Resident Evil release. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully I'll be back before then. Uh, But gentlemen, I think it's time for us to say goodbye. So, uh, yeah, say goodnight, everybody. Cheers, guys. Thanks very much for listening. Bye.